Hi there, these are your genetics notes. So be ready to write in as I continue on my video. So far, you have learned that genetic information is all located in the nucleus of cells. All the genetic information is located in the nucleus of cells. There is so <laughs> there is so much genetic material that is stored in the nucleus. So here is the breakdown. We're going to make a little flow map. I call this the flow map of genetic information. <laughs> First, we're going to write it in words and then we'll do it in a flow map form. The nucleus, which contains the chromosomes, and there's already a C there for you to write. Chromosomes, C-H-R-O-M-O-S-O-M-E-S. -O -O the nucleus which contains the chromosomes which hold the DNA. And the DNA is made up of multiple genes. G-E-N-E-S. Okay, so let's start with our flow map. We're gonna start with the cell. That's what we studied last unit. Inside the cell, you have the nucleus. The nucleus contains chromosomes. Chromosomes. The chromosomes hold the DNA strands DNA um, stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, <laughs> which are strands of protein um, with your instructions for life. <laughs> um, the DNA is made of genes. And underneath gene, I have it divided into an allele and an allele, which we will discuss later on the notes, but um, the genes come from one allele from mother, one allele from father. We can put an S there. And the genes determine the traits that we're talking about. Traits are going to be um, all the physical features of an organism. Height, shape, color, texture, all those things are going to be considered traits. So that was the flow map of genetic information, starting with the cell. Um, so I like this picture that it breaks it down for you as well, that you have cells inside the organisms. This, in this particular one, they chose a human. Um, the cells have the nucleus, which contain the chromosomes, the DNA, and then genes are located on the DNA. All right, so our question is, how do traits get passed down from one generation to the next? That's the big question for this unit. It's all through reproduction all through reproduction all living things reproduce all living things reproduce how the organism reproduces depends on how simple or complex it is so we're going to talk about both types of reproduction both types of reproduction both, here's some things that they both have in common. Both involve passing down, passing down genetic information from one generation to the next. They both pass down genetic information. Next one, both involve at least one parent and both involve the production of offspring, which are the children. Both involve at least one parent, both involve the production of offspring. Now we're going to talk about their differences. The, the names of the types of reproduction are sexual and asexual reproduction, as you know from your key terms. Sexual reproduction is going to involve two parents, one male and one female parent. Parents combine genetic information to produce new organisms. 
or organism. <laughs> Parents combine genetic information to produce new organisms. Half of the genetic information Half of the genetic information comes from the sperm cell and the other half of the genetic information comes from the egg cell, which is from the female and the sperm is from the male. Those are the reproductive cells, sperm cell, egg cell. Sexual reproduction is usually going to occur in complex organisms. And we'll give some examples of what can, is considered a complex organism in just a minute. Complex organisms. How are the offspring going to look? The offspring do not look exactly like either parent. They're going to look like a combination or they'll look more similar to one than the other. But they do not look exactly like either parent because they're getting half of their genetic information from the mom, half from the dad. Offspring are more diverse. Diverse means different. Meaning they're going to have different characteristics from each other. So they already don't look like exactly like the parents, but they also don't look like the siblings. You know, if they have siblings, they're not going to look exactly the same. Examples of organisms that are going to reproduce sexually are humans, of course. Mammals, bees, flies. Just because they're small doesn't mean they aren't complex. Fish, lizards, mice, frogs, and even chickens. All of these organisms are going to um, produce offspring by sexual reproduction. Okay, so moving on to asexual reproduction. When you have the letter A in front of a word, it means not. Or means without. Just a little side note there. If you want to put that, it's up to you. So asexual reproduction, and I'm going to actually take that away. Asexual reproduction involves one parent only, a single organism. There is no sperm and egg fertilization. So fertilization means just joining of. And I'll actually show you an image here coming up. Just writing what fertilization, what I just said, it means the joining of. So it's usually going to occur in simple organisms. Simple organisms. Like one-celled organisms. That's what I'm talking about when I say simple. And sexual reproductions are going to be multicellular. So you're going to have a lot of one-celled organisms with asexual reproduction. Offspring are going to inherit genes from only one parent. Offspring are gen genetically identical to the parent. Offspring are genetically identical to the parent. You would not be able to tell the difference between the parent and the offspring because everything about them would be identical because 100% of their genetic information is being passed down to the offspring. The offspring will look uniform So uniform is a word that means identical. Just want to give you more words um, in your vocabulary, science vocabulary there. Um, they'll look identical to each other as well as the parent. So all the offspring will look like each other and all the, all the offspring look like the parent. So some examples of these organisms that reproduce asexually are going to be bacteria, Bacteria, many plants do this. Um, hydra, I'm going to show you what a hydra is in a minute. Vegetables, simple sea life, plants, and creatures that live in the sea. 
ocean or lake. You know what? I want to go back up here because this is going to come to play. Something else that reproduces sexually are plants that have flowers. I'm going to write that in. I want you to as well. Because that will be on something that you're going to work with tomorrow. As you know, you should have picked up um, a flower at the school if you didn't have your own flower to pick up. We use um, just the simple lilies that you can see the anthers and the pollen. So make sure you have a flower to work with for Thursday, Friday. Keep it alive. Keep it in water until you need it. Okay, so plants with flowers. Make sure you've added that for sexual reproduction. So plants down here that don't have flowers, they're not going to reproduce sexually. They're going to reproduce asexually. So I just want to give you, um, you, if you want to look at more information about these processes, you can. Um, this year, we're not spending any time on these types of asexual reproduction, but some of them, depending on the organism, they're going to reproduce by something called binary fission, regeneration, budding, or vegetative propagation. Kind of a fun word to say. Um, so here's, let's look at some pictures. So sexual and asexual. This side right here is showing examples of asexual reproduction. Here is showing you sperm and egg cell um, fertilization. This is sexual reproduction. And let's label them. Okay, over here is what I was talking about, the hydra. The hydra is, um, I do believe it's freshwater. They live in, they're microscopic and they look like these little creatures right here. It, they have a tiny bump that appears on the side of them right here. And then it starts developing and getting bigger and bigger. And once it gets mature enough, it'll pop off and become its own independent hydra um, in the water. And it looks exactly like the parent because hundred percent of the genetic information is passed down through asexual reproduction. So this is asexual. Here again, you have, this is actually binary fission where you have one cell and it starts splitting into two. So asexual. And this is an example of regeneration where you have a starfish and part of the starfish breaks off and creates a new starfish from that broken up part. Kind of cool. Worms do that too. And lizards can regrow their tail. Okay, um, here you have, I, want, I have a, you're going to see different flower diagrams, but I put one here just to let you know that flowers have male and female reproductive parts. This part, the pistil part on the right, the pistil, see, has ovary. This is the female part of a flower. And that's writing so horribly because I have it. Let me make it smaller. So this is the female side of the flower, the pistil. In this section right here where it says stamen, the anther, and the filament, that's actually the male part of a flower. And the pollen is actually the male sex cell, the sperm cells. Just a little information you probably did not know, but you will need to know that. Um, sexual reproduction right here showing you, um, I like it because it's showing you actually where it's talking about fertilization, meaning the sperm cell and the egg cell are going to join together and create um, a zygote, when they're first fertilized, it's created zygote, which then becomes an embryo with a, a human growing there. So egg cell, sperm cell, fertilize together, share 50% of the genetic information, and uh, each, which makes 100% passed on when they are combined. Here is an um, example of uh, flower reproduction, if you're still just like, how in the world can they reproduce sexually? Here's a, a life cycle. So just might want to label that sexual reproduction. Okay. So we're going to move on and talk about how are we studying genetics now, the study of genetics and how traits are being passed down and who started all this. So here's a little bit of history. Always get, need to, good to um, include some history in our science. All right, so the study of genetics first began being studied and documented in the 1850s. He's by an Austrian monk named, and I want you to know his name. His name is Gregor, G-E-R-E-G-O-R, -E -E Mendel. Definitely know his last name. If you can't remember his first name, that's okay, but his last name is definitely something you want to remember, Mendel. He is known 
as the father of genetics. I think it's a title, father of genetics. And there's this little picture right there. Um, he was really smart in school and, um, his, his family didn't have a lot of money to keep him in the higher level schools. He eventually, um, found a monastery to be a part of, and he took care of the monastery garden. And, um, he worked under a lot of other, he had a lot of mentors at the monastery and that were very interested in science and coming, doing a lot of research and that really rubbed off on him. So we'll come back to him working in the garden, but let's finish our sentence here. He is known as the father of genetics due to his discoveries of the basic principles of heredity through his experiments in the monastery garden. And you watched in a puzzle that he used pea plants. So just a simple little plant that he studied with, for science. Um, and we're still talking about in, in the 2020s. Here's a picture of pea plants just showing you that they have flowers. So now that you know about flowers, they reproduce sexually. Um, they have the pea pods. They have different color of flowers. Some of them have white flowers. Some of them have purple flowers. Okay, so next bullet. He wanted to know if there was a certain pattern of handing down characteristics from one generation to the next. These characteristics that he studied are called traits. Traits are determined by genes. Again, we're kind of doing that flow map again. Characteristics are called traits. The traits are determined by genes, which are segments of DNA that contain the information about a trait. Remember, DNA has all the instructions, so they know what trait to come up with. Genes come in pairs. Each member of the gene pair, here's a new word, is called an allele, A-L-L-E-L-E. -L -L -E. Each gene pair is called an allele. The traits he studied um, with the pea plants, he studied how tall that they were because he noticed some were tall, some are short at full, at full growth. He studied the seed shapes, seed colors, pod shapes, flower colors. He studied those traits. He studied the pea plants because they grow and reproduce quickly. Oh, goodness. Stop. Let's write the word quickly. So that way he was able to study um, generations a lot over a year's time. Many years. When Gregor Mendel died at 61, his work had yet to be widely discovered. Um, they discovered it later when they found all you know his all his research being written down and sent in. His theories and research are now considered quite fundamental to the understanding of the field of genetics. He laid the foundation for a future geneticist. Okay, so we're gonna now work on some more of these terms that you've had and. Um, what Gregor Mendel started with, all the things he studied with um, his pea plants, and um, do some examples, show some examples. Through sexual reproduction, genes come in pairs, as we've said, because one is from the male and one is from the female. These gene pairs are called alleles. Now, these alleles, they can be dominant, dominant, or recessive. So I think a lot of you know what that word dominant means. It means like powerful, mighty. Okay. So that's going to come into play with what shows up on, a, on an organism. If they have dominant traits. Okay. Dominant allele. And I'm actually going to spell it all capitals for a reason. You can do that if you want. But you don't have to. Dominant allele is one whose trait is always seen in an organism. It always is going to show up, okay? Recessive, I'm going to write that all lowercase. Recessive allele is one whose trait is hidden 
or masks when a dominant allele is present. So because alleles come in pairs, there's only three combinations that can be. So here's our first combination. One parent can contribute a dominant allele and one parent can contribute a dominant allele. And what's gonna show up in the offspring? There's only one thing that's gonna show up. It's gonna be, they're gonna, the offspring will have the dominant trait. Now, if dad, um, he contributes a dominant trait and mom contributes a recessive trait, okay, so you have one of each, what's gonna show up in the offspring? Remember, if there's a dominant recessive, we just wrote that, the recessive will be hidden. I'm gonna X those out, so it'll only show a dominant in the offspring. The only way that recessive shows up is if both parents have contributed a recessive gene allele for that trait. So recessive plus recessive is going to show a recessive in the offspring. Now, um, the question that comes up from students, and it's a really good question, is how do we know what's dominant and what's, re what's recessive? And it's because geneticists, the scientists that study genetics, they look at so many samples of people's DNA, blood samples, and so they can look at the DNA and find all of these traits and be able to tell us what is showing up as dominant or recessive. So here's a quick chart just to give you some examples of what is considered dominant recessive, but every single trait an organism has is listed as dominant recessive. This is just a little bitty chart. Like, um, So dimples, it, anywhere you have dimples that's dominant and no dimples is recessive. Having a widow's peak, which is a um, triangular hair spot on, on your top of your forehead, that's dominant. Ha not having a widow's peak is recessive. Um, dark hair is dominant over lighter hair. Having freckles is dominant over no freckles. Dark eyes are dominant over colored eyes. Um, your earlobes, free earlobes, they give you a picture, are dominant over attached earlobes. So you can look up many more examples. You can look up in different organisms, what's dominant, what's recessive, but that just gives you a little start. All right, more information about <laughs> genes. Um, you have purebred and you have hybrid. Purebred, those organisms that have genes that are alike for a particular trait. So they both parents gave them both dominant or both recessive. They're matching um, alleles for a gene. Hybrid, an organism that has genes that are different. Think about a hybrid car. Hybrid car runs on gas and electricity, so it has both. So this would be an organism that had both um, a dominant and recessive allele contributed to them. What's going to show up in them is going to be the dominant, but they carry this. Every single trait you have, you have two um, alleles for. Okay, I'm gonna come back to purebred and hybrid in just a minute. I also want to say, I want you to know um, a sciencey word for purebred. The sciencey word is homozygous. And you might wanna practice saying that, homozygous. And the sciencey word for hybrid is heterozygous. Okay, so write that in next to purebred and hybrid. I just want you to be familiar with knowing the easier name and knowing the harder name because you have to know both. In science, there's a lot of terms you have to know both for. <laughs> um, to know some root words, homo means same, hetero means different. Okay, phenotype and genotype. Phenotype is the physical appearance of an organism. It is what you see what you can see with your eyes on an organism. So um, genotype is the genetic genetic makeup of an organism, the gene pair, the alleles. Remember, there's two alleles in sexual reproduction, one from the sperm cell, one from the egg cell. And I'm going to have you write this in. These are the letters. We're going to talk about letters. Okay. How you can keep these straight, like what is a phenotype, what's a genotype? Some of you this may help besides just memorizing the definition is phenotype starts with a pH and so does physical. Phenotype is physical appearance. Genotype, 
genetic makeup, the gene pair. Now, I say something about the letters. And for every um, trait, your geneticists have assigned letters for things for all of your alleles. So usually, let's say for tall and short, we use the letter T. So capital letters are represented for the dominant traits and lowercase letters are going to be represented for the recessive traits. So I want us to use the letter T and write an example. Remember, we're gonna write two letters because you have two alleles from each parent. So uh, let's see, purebred, how to write purebred, homozygous. Example would be big T, big T. And there's one more way you can write homozygous or purebred using the letter T would be little t, little t. So if we're talking about um, height, like so, tall is dominant over short, we always use the first letter of the dominant trait, just so you know. So this person would look tall and this person would look short. So these would be the phenotype. And the letters would be the genotype. Okay, and let's write an example of heterozygous, hybrid, with using the letter T. There's only one way to write um, using T's to show heterozygous, which is one dominant and one recessive, and that would be big T, little t. So how would that person look? What's their phenotype if they have a big and a little? If you don't remember, go back to this scenario. If there's a dominant and a recessive, what's gonna show up is dominant. So this person is going to look tall. So tall is the phenotype. And the big T, little t is the genotype. Okay. And we can also write in some examples of phenotypes. Um, I just wrote some tall, short, brown, round, wavy. Genotype would be, and you always use the same letters like big B, big B, or big D, little D, or little G, little G, okay? But like I said, it's, uh, geneticists are the ones that determine what's dominant recessive and what letters we use. But like I said, we take the first letter of the dominant trait. All right, something else you're gonna use in genetics and you're really going to use more of this in ninth grade biology, but I wanted to give you an understanding because um, just some basic information about Punnett squares. Punnett squares are charts used to show the possible gene combination of the offspring of sexual reproduction. It was developed by an English geneticist in the early 1900s, oh, I did not put his name, but we'll put it. His name is Reginald C. Punnett. I'm gonna run out of room. And um, let me write it below. So Reginald C. Punnett. Okay. It uses capital letters to represent the dominant allele. This is what I was telling you earlier. And lowercase letters to represent the recessive allele. Uses capital letters to represent the dominant allele and lowercase letters to represent the recessive allele. Each box in the Punnett square represents a possible gene pair of the fertilized egg. Remember that's the egg that's been fertilized by a sperm cell, one sperm cell. It also shows or explains how the offspring can have diff can have phenotypes, phenotypes different than their parents. So I'll let you take a look of some examples of um, Punnett squares just so you can see how they, the basic ones start out. 
Um, but we are not going to be making any this year. You just, get, you know, just have an understanding. It's the possible gene combination of offspring of sexual reproduction. Lastly, is talking about natural selection and selective breeding because it has to do with the best traits of an organism. The organism that has the the best traits. For an environment will survive to reproduce so the best traits are more likely to be passed on to the next generation the organism that has the best traits for an environment will survive to reproduce so the best traits are more likely to be passed on to the next generation so um, this is called natural selection write that in. This is called natural selection. What that means is, um, it's also called, oh, let's write it in. Survival of the fittest. That's its nickname, natural selection, survival of the fittest. Um, so organisms if they don't have the best traits, they're likely going to move somewhere else or most likely going to die. Um, and they won't be able to reproduce and thrive um, to pass on their the traits that they have. Natural selection, let's write in the next thing. Natural selection happens naturally. Organisms are adapted to survive in nature through genetic variation. So genetic variation, you know, the, think about humans. Humans are not all the same height. They, we have genetic variation in so many things. Um, we, you know, there's so many variations of hair color, natural hair color. Um, but, you know, we have different heights. We have different um, muscular growth, things like that. But same thing with plants and animals. Besides humans, they're going to have better traits to help them survive in the environment that they're in or else they're going to die off and they won't be able to pass on those, those um, traits. The next thing is called selective breeding. Selective, so it's something is, the, the traits are being selected, and guess who's selecting them? Humans. So selective breeding is the process of breeding plants and animals for particular genetic traits. Humans. Humans choose organisms that have certain traits that they find desirable and breed to create offspring with those traits. You hear a lot about that with dogs and some cats, of course, but you hear more about with dogs, but um, just for um, better looks or um, especially if they're doing show dogs and some of them are just so cute when they're combined. Um, selective breeding is also known as artificial selection. It's the creation of organisms with traits that humans want. So selective breeding is also known as artificial selection. It's the creation of organisms with traits that humans want. The organism might not survive in nature and there is a decreased genetic variation going on. A decreased genetic variation. So here's some examples of these are natural and these are artificial. Okay. Um, you know, you can look at it and it talks about these mice. You know, they're all the same kind of mice, but some of them are lighter in color. Um, well, the ones that are lighter in color are easier for the hawks to see above. And they easily pick off the ones that are lighter in color because they don't match that environment. They're not camouflaged in and can hide easily. So the ones that are around longer are the darker ones that match their environment and they, rep they thrive and reproduce and, and pass on that darker colored fur. The lighter colored fur mice, they get picked off and there's not as many. Um, same thing with giraffes, ones that have longer necks because you know they're not all gonna be the same length. Um, they can, it, where they live in a savanna, there are times of drought, they can get leaves, the taller ones can get leaves on any level of the trees. The ones with shorter necks 
not the best trait for they live. They can only get leaves at a certain level. They begin to die off because that's not the best trait to survive in that area. Here's a little chart I thought you might find interesting if you want to read through some things that humans have selectively breeded for um, uh, purposes. This one is talking about cattle that they've bred um, to make it better. Um, different roses they have humans have selectively breeded just to have different variety of color. Um, lastly, you, I want you to know about uh, another scientist. Natural selection was studied and researched by an English naturalist in the 1830s named Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin. He studied the beaks of the finch bird. He studied the beaks of the finch birds on the Galapagos Islands, which are located just to the west of Ecuador and South America. So he noticed that depending on what they were eating, which island they were on, their beaks were slightly different and allowed them to live longer depending on what the island offered, whether it was insects or seeds. But he can kind of see a variation over the years of different beak sizes and shapes, depending on what was available and which variation survived best. Survival of the fittest, natural selection. All right, those are your genetics notes. Please read over them more than once. Listen to this recording more than once. There's a lot of information to get soaked in, so it takes some practice, and you might be making your own flashcards or your own quiz, Quizlet to help practice these notes. All right, take care.